Andrea, it is awesome to see you again. You are, you've been on the podcast before. We talked about go for no. And the reason I asked you to jump back on again is I have been struggling with writing a book and you have a book out there that's been recommended by a couple of people, including Catherine Brown on the million dollar book formula. Why did you write the million dollar book formula? That is a great question, Mike. Because I ask myself that sometimes because Richard and I went down this road of wanting to help people write and publish books. It's like, have you ever heard the the phrase, uh, I just learned this, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it? Oh, yeah. Yep. Right? And so this this book was a labor of love that we actually wrote very quickly but the reason we wrote it is because with 20 years of publishing experience and knowledge, we were getting to the point where every week we were having somebody want to jump on a call with us to talk about their book, writing, publishing, our experience and all of that. And and of course, all these people are colleagues or their friends or whatever. And so we would never charge for this. And then we kept saying, well, we should make this into a business. So let's write a book that will launch that. That's a great way to launch the business. And then we did the business for a few years. And now we're getting out of the business because we realized that just because we could do it and have all the knowledge doesn't mean we should or that we really wanted to. It's just it's like one of those things It's like, you know, so much and you just think I should do something with all of this knowledge. That having said all of that, Mike, I am very proud of the book because it is our 20 years of experience and I guess our philosophies, you know, drilled down, downloaded into this book, which is how many pages? Yeah, it's 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 110 pages. And I think, and, it, and so there's a lot of tactics, a lot of philosophies in it. And we just really wanted to get out our experience to help people. I think one of the cool things about it when you know, I started reading it was the whole idea of it. Your book doesn't have to be this like 900 page story. You don't have to go out there and write the Odyssey or the Iliad. And you probably shouldn't. You highlighted how a number of the best selling books on Amazon are actually summaries of bigger books. <laughs> So like, what, what was the, what, why do people get into this view of, Hey, I, it just has to be big. It has to be a lot. It has to be much bigger than I'm, than I'm making it out to, to be. I think it's just that traditional thing that we have in our minds from maybe when we were younger about what a book is supposed to be. Although the irony is that when you were like six years old and le learning to read, you know, the books were all like 12 pages, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, we think that a book has to be 300, 400 pages. We're thinking of the Stephen King novel, like you said. And it was funny that you said the Odyssey or the Iliad. I was thinking the exact same thing. It doesn't have to be that way. And I think because so many of us in the teaching space, the entrepreneurial space, whether you're teaching people a sales skill or you're teaching people anything, I think there's kind of this idea that that in order to be an expert, it's got to be, you know, heavy. It's got there's got to be there's got to be a lot of content and you've got to share everything that you can possibly think of. And really what it comes down to, what ends up happening, I think, is you've got core points that are your cornerstones of what you want to teach. And then you really just spend a lot of time and a lot of pages backing that up with evidence or case studies or stories, which is great. But I think that people kind of get it. And if they trust you, it's kind of like make your point. And then you can do all that in other ways. You can make all you can you can add all the evidence in other ways. It doesn't have to end up being a 300, 400 page book. It gets, it's, I think, you know, you know, this, and we talked about this a while back about me going and going on the speaking journey and wanting to, wanting to move from unpaid speaking to paid speaking. And I was down at the NSA conference. And one of the things you see at a conference like that, when you see professionals out there who have honed their craft over time is how they embrace their own voice. They have a, a unique point of view 
that they're delivering and everybody ends up doing it slightly differently, slightly different. Like I'm, I'm not going to be, I will never be Larry Long Jr. That is not me. I'm not that energy, multiple microphones. And it is awesome that someone can do that. I'm also not going to be you. Why do I think that I can need to go through and write a book in the same way that everybody else has written a book? It's you you see it and then you you struggle at least for me I've struggled realizing I primarily have overcomplicated the idea of what does it really mean to write a book? What needs to be in a book? What kind of structure needs to be in the book? How do you do it? How do you publish it? All of these things. And I want to get a bit deeper into the discussion. But why do we why do we fall into this trap of trying to follow others or trying to do something that someone else has already done over and over and over again? Well, it's funny you'd say that because, and I totally agree with you. I think I think modeling is something that happens a lot in our industry. You know, yeah. we see people that we think are successful or we kind of want to emulate. We go like, oh, I, I'll kind of do what that person did. And, and we shouldn't feel compelled to do that. But I say it's funny that you'd say that because when Richard and I, and we tell the story, I think in Million Dollar Book Formula, when we decided, okay, we want to write a book that will be the door opener. It will be the thing that gets us hired to do training, to do speaking. If, yeah. if somebody reads the book and likes it, this is the reason they would hire us. And that's why we, that was our why of writing the book. Yeah. We were kind of like, we thought it would, it could sell too, yeah. but, um, but we were, we were more concerned with, you know, having it be the door opener. And so he went to Barnes and Noble and went to the, like, DIY section, I guess, found a book on how to self-publish. It was this little like five by eight green book, 64 pages. And he literally looked at that and said, let's do this book. Like, we'll just make a book exactly like this. Why would we try to, you know, we're not going to try to do and Let's make it simple. And we also, we were kind of thinking of our audience too, which didn't have a lot of, re- it was a retail audience and people who work in retail stores don't have a lot of time. They're busy helping customers all day long. So it couldn't be a 300 you know page book. So again, we, you really have to, and this kind of starts us down the road of what's in, what's, what's the formula that we yeah. have found and the, one of the the key pieces of that formula is the problem you're trying to solve. And our philosophy is stay narrow to that problem, stay as niched as you can to that problem. And when you do that, I don't think it requires, you know, 300 pages. It just, it just doesn't. And our strategy all along has been, yes, you want a best-selling book, but more than anything, you want a best consumed book. You want a book that gets consumed. That's your goal. A book that doesn't get read, that sits on somebody's shelf, is great that you made the 20 bucks on it, but it's not going to get you clients and it's not going to help them change. So do it, whatever the problem is. And if the problem requires 300 pages, so be it. You know, that that's the problem that you're, that you're trying to solve. In fact, oh, I, there's a book that we have... And I cannot believe how huge it is. It's by a guy named Dr. Aziz. And it's called, it's something about not being nice. It's okay. it's a self-esteem book about, yeah. about not being about not being nice. And it's gotta be 450 pages. And it makes me a little crazy. But you know, as I'm reading and I'm like, okay, this big problem this guy is solving. And he's tackling a lot of issues. And I I probably wouldn't have gone a, you know, I, I wouldn't have done it like this. But it's okay that he did. At the same time, I think he could have split this book up into eight different books and tackled a singular problem in each. I see a lot of correlations between writing a book and speaking. And like there's this the one of the challenges that I run into is scope creep. I someone will ask a question that I know the answer to, that I know that we can solve for is something that's been created, but it's not part of the core topic that we're talking about. And I think, well, you know what, quickly, I can connect the dots between, I can make the couple of step jumps between this, that, and this that gets me there. And then I start answering the question and realize I've just lost 
the audience. So as you're going through the writing process, how do you, and I see you nodding. So like, we're, we're, so how do we maintain, how do we keep narrow that focus, keep that niche focus on the problem and not allow the scope creep, the, that curse of expertise to start drawing you into down a bunch of rabbit holes or down a, a bunch of other lanes associated with the river. Right, right. So my favorite way to do this is to, and we did this with with a couple other people's books. And it was the only way for us to, we helped a guy write a book on social media. And it was the only way for us to help him write this book. And it was short. It was 110 pages, like what we recommend. Yeah. And we just asked question after question after question and turned those questions into headers that were no longer questions. So it was kind of like, um, if I have a team, how do I teach my team social media? And so then the header would become how to teach your team social media. And then the next question was like, what if I've done social media all wrong and I've alienated a bunch of people in my life? What to do when you have you know, done social media wrong and you've alienated people, that becomes the header, right? And so you, I, I love the question answer formula because if you just write out all the questions mm -hmm. and then all the answers and then go back, and this is, this is where, it be, you know, you have to become ruthless as you start saying what question is not a must know, it's more nice to know. You know, there's the the must know and questions that you you must have, and then there's the the nice to know, and then there's the this is just me like wanting to answer this question and it doesn't need to be there. And for those things, that's the great material that you can create a little bonus content. And at the end of your book, then this is a great marketing strategy. Say you may have some more questions. I, I've got a, you know, a special report where I dig into a few things that I didn't cover in the book. You mm. can pick this up for free. Go, go grab the download. Right. And so for people who are really engaged with you and now they've read the book and they want to get more, it's a great way to stay engaged with them. So you have 13 ingredients that are in the book. Uh, That's that right. You lay that you lay out when that need to be incorporated into, into a book or as you go through the design process of building out your book. One of the things that I thought was really interesting that you do in the book is you compare other books that you've written against those 13 ingredients. And what did you find when you, when you did the, when you did the comparison? Yeah. So a couple of the books lacked, and I can't remember if it lacked it. One of them lacked, I think almost every ingredient that there was. <laughs> And this is where, you know, what's that phrase, the, the cobbler's child has no shoes. This is where no matter how you want the universe to work, sometimes we channel Steve Jobs and we, it, you know, you always hear like Steve Jobs bent the universe to match what he, so we're like, we're going to ignore all of the rules that we know work in writing and publishing, and we're going to do what we want. And we broke all of those rules. We ignored all of the ingredients in our book and the book was a complete and total unmitigated disaster. And so, uh, so yeah. And then we had a few books that had what I'd call moderate success don't really sell to this day unless I really decide to like promote it. And then we have a couple that have done really well because it had, you know, maybe not all 13 ingredients, but it certainly had 10, 10 of the 13. If you were to like, what's a good, yeah. What's a good ratio is 10 of 13. Okay. I ideally 13 of 13. If you nail all of them, what's, what is there a breaking point where you start to say, okay, by if I'm not at least at this point, I'm going to have to work really, really hard to get this done. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I could overcomplicate it and say that there are a couple ingredients that are must haves that mm -hmm. if you didn't have these, the book wouldn't, you could have, you know, 10, but if you didn't have a couple of, of the really important ones, the book is not going to work. And that like, so one of them is really, two of them for sure is your prospect, you know, understanding the person you are writing the book for. And the second one is the problem. We've kind of talked about, you know, the problem that the book solves that, that main theme. And so if you don't, if you don't have super clarity on that, then everything else is going to be a problem. 
pricing will be a problem because it's like, who's supposed to buy the book? Promotion will be a problem. Who are you marketing it to? One of the ingredients is partnership. So it's kind of like finding people to be partners with you, whether that's a co-author or just people helping you, helping you market it. That said, so assuming you have like those two really core ingredients, you know, I think you could probably have just over half and do okay and maybe go through and identify, okay, this is, these are a couple things that I'm missing that are causing this to be a little bit of a struggle, you know, and, and, but I, I think that oftentimes if you stick with it and you don't give up on your book too soon, which is such a huge issue for authors, you can overcome a lot of the, a lot of those deficiencies through promotion and marketing and just getting it out there. Why, why do people struggle with narrowing down the niche of people that they're focused on, the, their, their, their ICP for the book or their ideal customer profile for the book? Yeah. I, I guess it's just fear. I mean, I, you know, and I get that fear because when, you know, like everyone else, when I d come up with an idea, it's like, well, technically this is for everyone. <laughs> you go for, from like having this, I, you know, ICP, as you said too, like everybody needs this. Everybody on the planet needs go for no, it's true. Yeah. Um, and then you, and then it's like, wait a minute, that's great, but that is not going to sell books or sell courses or sell anything else. If you go out there and like, you know, 85 year old grandmother could use this. A 12 year old selling cookies could use this. It's like, that's unhelpful. So I, I think, Mike, I think it's just fear and it's fear of loss. And uh, and I think that we are eager to please and we have a concept that we know theoretically help the majority of people. So I think maybe there's also this idea that, you know, I don't I don't want to pigeonhole this book. This book is needs to be out in the world and it needs to be, you know, more things to more people. And it's challenging. You know, I worked with a lady who wrote a really interesting book. It was fiction. I was actually helping her advertise it. And it was fiction. It was a, excuse me, it was not fiction. What I wanted to say, it was nonfiction. It was about her life. What made me say it was fiction was she had a cover that felt very fiction-y. Mm, it, okay. it was like a fiction book cover. And there was, and it was, a, and it was really big. It was really long. There was a, it, it was just a, a big book. And it also had, though, it had a lot of different elements in it of, of things that she was trying to, themes that she was trying to bring through the book with her life story. And, and almost um, halfway through, it really transitioned to this other kind of, kind of thing, almost spiritual, um, yeah. but also very businessy. And it was just really difficult to wrap my head around how to position it, who the book was for. And at the end of the day, it was kind of like what I realized was this is for women who liked Elizabeth Gilbert's Eat, Pray, Love. Um, okay. I think that's the name of the book. Very you know popular book, tur got turned yeah. into a movie with Julia Roberts. But the, but the challenge was... It was there was it was so hard to really just say it's for this person to solve this problem. And if yeah. you're not Oprah, see Oprah could pull that off. She could have a fiction, a fiction style book cover with an owl and a tree on the front and a title that made no sense that was completely irrelevant to the cover. And then she could have 400 pages rambling about whatever she wanted and she'll sell three million of them. For the rest of us, we cannot do that. There, there aren't very many Oprahs out there, right? It's, it is. I mean, we see this, or I see this over and over again with, or with early stage founders. This idea of, you know, who your ideal customer is, or who the target market is, and they're kind of like, well, yeah, it's anybody. And if you squint, you can kind of manufacture fit. And what ends up happening is you just get into a situation where you're even post implementation, you're pulled in 80 different directions. And now all of a sudden your development team and now this is starting to build on behalf of customers who really shouldn't even be your customers, but you're trying to secure them. So you don't see things churn. And it just, it's, it seems like this theme recurs over and over again. And I really like that 
piece that you had highlighted there about the risk of loss, the fear of loss, the fear of not of the fear of missing out on an on an audience. And I think the question and the question I'm going to reflect on as I'm going through this is by not isolating for a specific variable who is not benefiting from the book that would have had I been more clear about who this book serves. I see you nodding. Yeah, that yeah, that is so true. And I actually have two women that I know, uh, Nancy Bleaky, Blakey, I'm pronouncing her name right. She's a member of the Women's Sales Pros group that I'm a member with, with Catherine Brown. And she wrote a book recently on sales, and it was specifically for financial advisors. And I'm sure that, you know, I don't know if this is true, but there may have been a part of her that was like, insurance professionals could read this and lawyers could read this. Yeah. And while I'm at it, CPAs could read this. And it's like, yes, they could. But if you just want to work with financial advisors who want to make X dollars per year, you know, it's perfect. This is your call. This is her calling card. Now all she has to do is focus on those people and what we also know about marketing is if you're a financial advisor and you manage a portfolio of X dollars and you and you bring in X dollars a year yourself, who do you probably hang out with? People just like you, right? right. Or people who maybe are a little bit lower in income and want to move up. And maybe you also in your circle have people that you mentor you who are doing better. Right. And so now if you could get that one person to read that book, they'll recommend it to people who are doing well. They'll recommend it to the people who are struggling. And now your marketing just becomes so much easier. So let's work our way through some of the ingredients. So okay. um, I have my books to remember what I said. All right. I, and I've got, I've got the, I've got the index in front of me as well. Okay. Purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Question number one, why are you writing the book? Why are you writing the book? Is this about, is it about me? Is it about them? Is it about- It's truly about you. It's truly, this is the, I think the opportunity and we may have, I think, come at that question in, in both respects. I'm glad you made the distinction, but yeah. to me, it's to get selfish and to say like, why do I really, why do I really want the book? What do I want it to do? for me do i it, am i looking at this as an income stream and if so then you really want to pay attention to the marketing and and i have had people and and this is funny because i think everybody thinks oh well of course you're writing the book for x result and it's not necessarily true there are people who write books for all different kinds of reasons and sometimes it's just it's on their bucket list and they don't care if the book sells. It's not, it's like, I just want to have a book. I just want to have this book, my story with my name on it. It can sell five copies and I'm happy with that. And other people, it's like, it's a door opener. I, they'll tell me, I don't want, I don't care if I make a do dollar on this book. I just want to get the book in as many hands as possible because I know that by doing that, it will lead to what I really want, which is X result. You know, I want more speaking or I, I want people to hire me for my, you know, as a consultant. So your purpose, really yeah, important. I, I think the, one of the things that is you're talking through it, that really jumps out at me, what's the job to be done of the book? What it, let's be super, super clear, really narrow down. What is the job to be done? And then think about the people that you work with who or tools that exist out there that have multiple purposes, do you are, are you better served by a tool that has a specific job in the right context to do the right thing at the right time, or are you better served by a you know, a Swiss Army knife? Now, in some contexts, a Swiss Army knife could be really, really good. In other instances, you just need a hammer, or you need a Phillips head screwdriver, or you need a knife, or whatever whatever the thing is. So that's what jumps out at me. As you talk about purpose, I, we hit on the second ingredient about problem and prospects, the th second and third problem and prospects product. What, what do you mean by product? 
Yeah. So that's just the book itself. And that gave us the opportunity to talk about the idea of page count. And okay. when we launched our publishing company, we called it Success in 100 Pages because we were like, we are only writing books around 100 pages. They ended up going about 115, 120 with all the little after after pages and all that. We only want to help people write books that are around 100 pages. And the reason for that, and, and that's where we made the case, and you and I talked about this at the beginning, of the fact that books are getting shorter. And that that is a trend. There have been books in the past that were really successful, and they were kind of one-offs. Who Moved My Cheese was a incredibly, um, I mean, it was like the book of the decade in the 90s yeah. for for. For change. The One Minute Manager was a pretty short book, small pocket size book, sold, I'm sure, millions of copies. And so, yeah, the product is the book itself. And so you're thinking about like size and how many pages. And when I say size, I mean, literally like how, how big you want to be. So, some things, and this is, goes to your point that you were just talking about, you know, sometimes when you get into it, you may discover that the thing that you want to do is not best served by a book. Mm. Maybe it's best served by a workbook, something yeah. different. Maybe it's, you know, in, and I'll give you an example of that. During the pandemic, Richard and I created a workbook called the Go For No Leader. Okay. And we had no desire to write, you know, a traditional leadership book in our head. This So this is a follow-up to our Go For No book. But we wanted to create a tool because we were sitting around doing nothing. So we were like, all right, well, let's let's create something. But again, we didn't want to write just a, a book on leadership. That's not really who we are. That's not, you know, it, it, it's definitely something that we wanted that we have uh, content for. It yep. just was better served in a different format. So I think when you start getting into product, thinking through what am I trying to accomplish, sometimes you might decide that it's actually not a book and maybe it's something else. Yeah. I think that's the, the, uh, like, just as you're, as we're talking through this, the freedom of letting go of a preconceived notion that you have around what this thing needs to be. And I, I, th there's part of me that's thinking, heck, maybe I just go ahead and build out a children's book because one of my favorite children's books is, Oh, the places you will go. I, that, that is a Dr. Seuss book that I've given. I can't even think the number of times that we've given that book out as a graduation gift. And yeah. it is the questions and the comments and the story inside that book are so freaking powerful. And it's simple enough that you can read it in a couple of minutes and you, you can actually, I, I, this came up in a conversation a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, maybe a couple months ago, but uh, no, John Lithgow actually narrates the book on audible. So you can pick oh. up an audible version of, Oh, the places you'll go and listen to John Lithgow. I think I'm saying his last name yeah. or pronouncing it right. I narrate this book and it's, it's phenomenal. And it actually has sound effects in the background too, as you're going through this. So if you've not, if you haven't read, Oh, the places you'll go, in a while, pick it up. And if you are interested in listening to it, it's just a quick listen from look out, but that it serves a very important purpose for you know, from a mindset perspective, it reinforces the importance of resilience, the importance of testing, the importance of getting, putting yourself out there, the importance of understanding there will be ups and downs and that that's all part of it. And yet there are people who will read 300 page books on self-help that w w mm. may miss some of those key tenets of it. So uh, this has got me thinking a bit differently about what, what the book might need to be in order to do the job, that job to be done piece. Yeah. I mean, and these days there's, it, it's, it's so much easier to get help to figure out, okay, what do what do I want? Maybe it's not. Yeah, maybe it is a children's book. There's been a few people actually who've done children's book with some success. John Burroughs, Arrows, mm -hmm. yeah, yep. did a children's book for sales. Somebody else did a children's book just recently. A, a few people have like, at, you know, in business. And I think they always go over really well because there's just always that 
everybody's a kid inside, right? So we, and we all love simple or even just, you know, staying with the really small or small book or doing a book in a format that's very different. My friend Jennifer Powers wrote a book called O Shift and awesome. and the yeah the the f in shift was kind of falling off falling off you can imagine on the cover yeah. and yeah. it's all about what happened what it, how do you react when things you know go badly and and shifting your mindset but the formatting in that book is just incredible there are pages with one word on them there are pages with a couple sentences and then there are pages with uh, text on the entire page, big words though. I mean, it's just, it's just, she just did it really cool. So the rules of what your book has to look like inside are just, they're, they're gone. It's, it's like, I think people embrace the creative. And we'll include links in the show notes to, to, to your book. And I think going through and reading it is important to, to understand these individual ingre- ingredients. There's a, a couple of other ones that I'd like to get into. Yeah. Uh, like when you say placement, what do you mean? What's, what's placement do for folks? So what, why is that important? Yeah. Placement is important. And it's some of these things, like, again, this is probably a lot more nuanced than the pr- than the problem ingredient, which is far more important. Placement just has to do with, you know, where are you selling your book? And I'll, t- I'll tell you one of the strategies that Richard and I have employed from the beginning. We, when we published Go For No, Amazon didn't exist. So we were yeah. selling <laughs> books from our own website, which you can imagine was like fundamentally impossible. <laughs> it was very difficult. So most of what we were selling would be if we sent a copy to a decision maker, like a VP of sales, and then they would end up ordering 20 books or 50 yep. books or whatever. So we were selling books in bulk and fulfilling them. And then when we started selling on Amazon, we realized that by sending traffic to Amazon, that kind of boosted the Amazon algorithm, which is this mysterious thing that nobody really knows how it works, kind of like all the social media platforms. Nobody understands how this works, but Amazon rewards books with eyeballs when traffic goes to a particular book page. You know, when you go to a a page with the book description and all of that, and you buy the book, Amazon likes to see that. And so we learned from a placement standpoint that we didn't really need to be concerned with the fact that it wasn't in Barnes and Noble and we weren't at the local bookstore. In fact, we decided we wanted all of our traffic to go to Amazon because the more people went to Amazon, also the higher we would be on the seller lists <laughs> or, you know, so, so on the sales category, if you have the top 50 sales books, instead of being 237th because we sell only on Amazon, you know, we're 35th. And we would rather have that because we may have a chance to get seen by a new customer. So placement is all about thinking about where you need to be. And to us, being in one sales channel is okay. You know, some people who have like the dreams of being a Wall Street Journal bestseller, then they have to they have to go with a publisher who will make sure that they're in all of those channels. So that's that's what placement has to do with. So let's talk about your most recent book. Yes. What's the title? It is When They Say No. So we went from go for no, telling people to hear no more often to, all right, you got to know. Now, what do you do? We probably should have written that a lot sooner, Mike. I mean, and as you know, and from a from a strategic standpoint, waiting 22 years is not something that we recommend. Like, if you're gonna, if you want to do a book series, maybe shorten the time frame between the first book to writing the follow up, something closer to maybe like five to seven years. It doesn't, you know, don't wait 22 years. What drove you to write when they say no? I was dying to write something that was a little meatier and a little more tactical because we get asked all like our advice is don't be afraid to hear no. In fact, as a salesperson, you, you've got to go for no. You, you need to hear no more often. And then the next question would be, all right, so now that I got a no, now what? 
Now, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to say to that? How, how am I supposed to respond? And we don't deal with any of that and go for no. It's kind of like, well, you know, you're just going to, you're going to hear no. That's the advice. Keep going. Suck it up. Be persistent. Keep showing up. You can do it. And so when they say no gave us an opportunity and we broke it into 41 strategies of what to think, say, and do. And that's another little piece of advice I would have if you're writing like a nonfiction kind of how-to book is some kind of device. You know, the 41 strategies worked for us. Yep. We talked about the question answer strategy for writing earlier, you know, where you you just come up with all the questions. But I think that's probably the thing as writers that we, and this is something that is hard to do, I, I admit, we've just been doing it a long time, but finding some way in, right? It, it's like, you just, you feel like, I'm just going to write this book and it's just going to start on page one and it's just going to flow and flow and flow. How do I segment it? How do I encapsulate it? And so think creatively and think, okay, maybe there are 10 strategies. Maybe there are, you could just answer, just make it a Q&A book. There's some way in. So that was our way in on this book was doing 41 strategies of what to think. So they go from anything from, you know, if you if you got no, maybe you weren't listening. If you got no uh, follow up, if you if you got no, were you talking to the right person? Right. Really important question to, to reflect on that. If you got a no, do they were you clear? Do they really understand the offer? So it's all of those things of digging in more strategically than we do with Go the original, which is so much just a mindset book. What what strategy of the 41 would you have not been able to include as a follow-up to Go for No if you did it three years after? You wrote Go for No. Like what's a, what's a new strategy Gosh, that's, that's such kind a, of come That's up? such a great question. Um, oh my gosh, that's such a great question. Is it really? I, I, so I, yeah. don't, I don't. Maybe it's a crap question. <laughs> no, I think it's a good question because I think the answer to that question is, and th maybe this is why we needed to wait so long. A lot of them, probably okay, over cool. half, yeah, and oh. and not because not because the strategies are so technologically cutting edge because yeah. listening clearly has been around for a long time but i think because i wasn't prepared to answer those questions 3 years later and with listening to the questions that we get asked over and over and over of these 20 years it was kind of like, we'll just go back and deal with all of the stuff that people want to know, which is how do I respond to a no? What am I, am I supposed to like stay engaged with this person or am I just supposed to cut and run and never, and never call them again? You know, those are the kind of questions we get. So having all that experience uh, enabled us to very quickly just think of all the things that we wanted to say. That is an awesome answer. I, I, and the re, the thing I love about the answer is you know, we don't really know what we don't know. And then over time, we learn. And if we're taking a continuous learning approach, a beginner's mind approach to the way that we go about doing our work, there'll be other layers, deeper layers of the, of the stuff that will start to reveal itself over time. And I think that's that's really, really powerful. So maybe it's not as much don't wait 22 years to do it. It's it's give it the 22 years to to work to slow cook in the crock pot or on the smoker so that it's so that it's ready for that time and place. What's another strategy that you think would be cool to cover that pe typically people don't think of when they get a no? my favorite one that I got to talk about in the book was to change your state of mind. Because one of the questions that we get a lot of times is what do, what, what do I do when I'm just getting no after no after no after no. Oh, okay. And yeah. right. And, and I think there's two things. One is at least make sure that you have enough data to switch up your strategy. You know, you can't just get a couple couple no's and go like, this is not working. This approach is, this script is not working. And I'm like, wait a minute. You've done it for half a day. <laughs> like, you, you know, you have to take some more time. Couple that with just the 
I think deflation and uh, a lot of what I've been hearing lately from people is I'm ground down. I, I this is it's a grind. It, it's such a grind. And, and a lot of people that we end up talking to, you know, they're making 80 calls. Their, their expectation is 80 calls a day. And I, I don't necessarily subscribe to those kind of numbers. I, you know, I, I get it. I understand the need for for quantity. So state, so changing your state is just the power of music, the power of movement, the power of getting up, the power of changing your your physiology. And we reference Tony Robbins for that. I think it's just a powerful strategy that we don't think about when we are getting a lot of no's and we're experiencing a lot of rejection. It's just kind of like we hunch over, we fret, we feel bad. And it's like, no, drink some water, get up from your desk, move. I, I think we just allow ourselves to kind of stew sometimes. Yeah. Well, it's a, it, and I can, I'll share just personal experience where I find myself in that trap is if I'm uh, overtired, I'm not working out. And now we've got a lot of negative things that are going on. And then I'm just kind of stuck in that, in that mode. And I, I, I forget about how important it is to re-energize and kind of and rest and recuperate and get out of the current operating environment that I'm in and maybe go walk the golf course or go for a drive or listen to music or whatever that thing is. But to get out of that out of that state, I had a rep that used to work um, work with me a number of years back, and you could you could tell when we were working on a new project. So after we had launched Catalyst, we were working on a new project and you could just hear the conversation. This is back when we were in an office environment. You could hear that the that he was anticipating the objection, the the no that we were going to get. And it, it was like, nope, oh, as soon as I got the no, then I'm just going to go. That, I got what I expected. I'm going to go and hang up and move on to the next one until I get the next no. And it was just, we were constantly looking for the no rather than going through and saying, okay, what's changed? What are we actually doing? Are we working with the right, are we working with the right people? Are we just going through the motions, hoping to get some kind of, oh, actually hoping to get the result that we expect and then checking that one off the list and moving forward. So I, I really like the, 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 the reinforcement of the importance of state change and changing the environment that you're in the physiology so that you can respond a bit different like is i i think people when you're when they anticipate the negative thing you can kind of smell it and you can you can taste it and you can kind of you can yeah. you can you can kind of take people will talk about it in the context of sales all, all the time with commission breath right like it's hey yeah. am i doing this thing for are you doing this thing for me because you really want to help me or are you doing this thing because you just want to get the sale done and i think people can note will notice that that desperation that you have if you're constantly anticipating or expecting the no. Really cool. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. What's next for you? So tell me, you, you guys have said, hey, we're not doing this. We're going to focus on that. What's what's that? What's next? You know, it's actually, we're kind of going back to basics and having more fun with go for no. We, we used to have, uh, several years ago, we had kind of wanted to create a world of go for no. We had swag and we had all kinds of fun stuff and we got out of that mode. And so now we're going back to it and making some, making some fun stuff. And so making some new products for the store that like we play this go for no game on stage. So we've created the game that we can sell in the store. So just going back and, and reinvigorating kind of back to the basics, actually. Well, welcome back to your roots. Welcome back to the, to the basics. Where should we send folks? Go for no. I'm at go for no on Twitter and Instagram. And if you type go for no in, you'll find me. I'll include links in the show notes. If you know somebody who would enjoy this conversation, please share it with them. Let us know via Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Sales is a thinking process. Business is a thinking process. Life is a thinking process. How are you thinking differently about your process? 